Hey everybody, this is Petey from the Spinner Rack, and um, we're coming back, maybe, I don't know if we're coming back, but I decided to do a video, a quick video. I had some stuff planned. I wanted to do something on the post, um, uh, post image group legend, but I wound up not, yeah, I have that, I'm not sure if that's gonna be something you guys want, and something I like, but um, anyway. What else we got going on? We got some movie stuff happening. What else do we have? We have some, some movie commentary on the Superman, um, the animated movies. We have um, Star Trek Picard that we need to get to. We have um, possible other Netflix shows. Um, obviously, comic book news, stuff like that. I still want to get back to the possible. So I want to talk about the John Burns spec project that's on his website, the the X-Men else win that I've been gearing up to do. We haven't figured the time to do that either. So we got a lot of stuff coming, hopefully, and in between working, because this is a still a work day. And, um, you know, this is what this is where it is. We find a time to fit this in and give you guys the stuff you want, and hopefully this stuff you want. But then tell us what you want, and we'll do it. We did Avengers Forever. We've done some things, some reviews. We have to get back to the uh, the old guard you seem to like it and i got the name of one of the creators wrong with some people joked about in the comments i don't delete that stuff hey it's on me so um what was i gonna do now what's there to do now i said since i mentioned john Byrne twice might as well do something else i'm not doing next man i would love to do that i'm trying to figure out what next to do get it what next to do but anyway another bad joke but <laughs> What what I'm planning to do next is doing um, this story that lives in infamy. And this story that lives in infamy, let me go to our um, handy dandy screen sharing abilities and we shall go to the Alpha Flight. Now, Alpha Flight number six, this lives in infamy because the context of the time is kind of lost. And it doesn't, um, the cover doesn't have the Assistant Editor's Month listed on the cover. Like most of the Assistant Editor Month, this is a month at Marvel where Jim Shooter said that the Assistant Editors would be covering the books. So, of course, something wacky would happen. The truth involved in this was um, the editors still did their work. The creators had to come up with something wacky that would happen in the comics, where the Avengers, the Reserve Avengers would go to um what was it to see david the david letterman show to actually date the time this came out it was like 83 84 sort of time you had fantastic four john Byrne is actually in the trial of um of reed richards you had john Byrne also meet the thing and, and possibly get killed by the thing in uh. thing number six and then lastly well not lastly because it went through the whole line we had Snowblind. And this just let you know there was Assistant Editor Month. We go to the next issue, which is, of course, it has it here, there. If you look down, it says, it's Assistant Editor's Month. Don't say we didn't warn you. Now it says, don't say you didn't warn you. So it's not, something's wacky gonna happen in this book. So the context has been kind of lost because they've been like, oh, this is Snowblind, the uh, Snowbird fights. Obviously, if you're looking back at the cover, she fights in the, uh, she's actually, either she's been blinded by the sunlight or something where the snow actually gets her blind. This is the hint of the cover. So in this issue, and the sister and editor's mother, as I said, we go further, she fights Kolomak. Now she's fighting Kolomak. This is one of the great beasts that she's been trying to take out. This is the whole reason why she's on the team, is out to take out these, these, um, these great beasts. I think there was 10 of them, there might be more, I'm not sure. But this is the ultimate focus of the Alpha Flight comic book. And um, even though I think John Byrne had a lot of issue with this sort of his art at this period, I sort of, I, I still sort of like this. And maybe at the time I was kind of finicky and wanted a really sharp, clean, crisp line. But at the same now, time now, I look at it and I'm like, this is a little more, you know, this, this not it's just it's a little rougher, which I, I'm, I'm starting to appreciate. I appreciate more as time goes on. So in this book, obviously Snowbird comes. She reveals herself, and then she's like, "Oh, she's actually 
the descendant of Nelvana. And next thing you know, this will, this makes uh, the Colomac decide, you know what I have to do? I have to go even further. I have to do a, a snowstorm. You can't beat me in his own element. So what does it say? Nothing, bitch. So in this battle, this shows the next pages is entirely in the snowstorm. And it's literally blank pages in the snowstorm. You know, it's literally just white. So now you're looking at this and saying, many fans go, still go back to this book and say, oh man, come on. He's like, he, he totally, he totally. Now, ultimately what we as fans want is to see the fight. And this goes back to what I call, um, I would call the Kirby min minimalism. So it's, if you don't have to draw it, some in the early Fantastic Four period, if you don't have to draw it, don't draw it. This is the key part to, to this period in Marvel where it says, does the story come through? And that's the thing. They set up, we go back to early, they set up the snowstorm, and it's a creative decision. And it also plays ult to, ultimately to a Mad Magazine where they play with the titles, showing how titles can give effect and heighten scenes. And this obviously is this exploration of storytelling. You have this sort of effect in the book. You have some of his more aggressive layouts. Some of the, that's something you'd see him do a lot later. Something I think Eric Larson likened to Topic Fallen's art, but I want to do that also because this clearly shows you he is, you know, doing different things as far as page layouts in this book. And this definitely has the mad effect with this sort of the sort of paneling that you see. I think Neil Adams did. I'm not sure who did it first in this sort of style, but I think Neil Adams did a little before Byrne, and Byrne had done it a lot during, I think, the, the last Galactus story. So you get all these cool effects. Even there's the motion, the thought balloons, everything is in here. And it's still going for this many pages, breaking panels. And it's like every effect that could possibly use to contain this story to say that this battle is going on. And it still doesn't end there. Look at that. Look at how many pages we got in. She's bleeding. She's struggling in the fight. And the, the whole sort of Stan Lee drama is being played out here at the same time of these, these, um, these two combatants are fighting in the snowstorm. And then you get to the end. And that's the thing I know as a fan that killed us. It killed us as fans when we got to this last page and we see the rubble and the snowbird is buried. Colomac again, but it's such a, such a great, great final panel, which is just like, man, I wish I could have saw that fight. And that's what we kind of still feel like we're old. We're not old, the story is there. And it's assistant editor's month, so it's sort of something that would be wacky and um, fun to do. And when I get to this thing, it sells. And that's the one thing that um, I think Neil Adams brought up as far as art. We go back to the front and see how many pages. The establishing here, right? And then we go through all of this. And we get to here. This establishes that this fight actually went on. Now, I think that's this last page. I also like the shot of Snowbird at the top. And um, I thought that was really cool, having some of the lingering effect of that battle. And then you see the regular people walking up. So, I mean, I'm not sure. When I was a kid, I probably was upset about this. But um, let's go back to the lead page. It's a definite exploration in storytelling, and it's clear. You still understand what's going on. And behind the scenes, um, Byrne was fully paid for all the pages as far as his sense of his artistic decision. And I think Byrne also said he did have to do layouts for it so he could design the panels. And I think that led Roger Stern to say that was the most graphic battle that ever happened in comic books. So it could be half joking, half that, but as things go online now, they're like, how could Byrne do this? How could they allow him to do this? But this is shooter. He would, uh, you know, unless it's an artistic decision, you know, these things don't go over. So that's one thing. But then if that's the case, let's stop just sharing for a second. Now, that's the case. Where do we, we've seen sort of this done before 
at other times. So we can't, is it just the burn thing? The, like Burns own, the Burns decision to do something like that? And it's actually not. If you go to, if we go to another book that was out, I think the same month as Burn. If we go to, let's see, where, where are we at now? So if we go actually to another comic book at the time, which was also Liz and Infamy. Let's see if we can see that. Let's go to Ronin. Now Ronin is a classic Frank Miller story. I think in historically it's aged a lot better. You see one of the things since Frank Miller was doing a departure, every issue of the comic book, he'd also have um, actual recommendation and a quote from a um, either a literary a giant, an inker, and two great artists saying what they felt about this book. And this is almost helping the fans because it was a departure from superheroes. And Frank Miller is doing something that's outside of his style with um, Claus Jansen, which he did, obviously, The Dark Knight. So if we look at this book, he also did some explorations of using lack of color or where as Byrne used white, he used his strongest trait, straight, oh, sorry, his strongest trait in his art, which is black. So if we go to this story, let's see, let me see this. So this, the character's in black, but as you go along to the scene, it's more black as it goes along. Now I'm not getting into the story, we just get into the storytelling of these characters and constantly there's more black and more things reveal itself because it's in total darkness. So then there's fire here and that leads you to why there's more light. But as it goes on and the fight happens, we see, we, we get to see only a portion of the, this image. And as it goes along, it gets darker and more darker on the page. And then we lead to the big battle where we see to see her cover and then the light's gone. And then it goes to total darkness. Now this one, now I think, I think Ronan as a whole had its, you know, I think fans kind of, kind of um, didn't stick with it, even though it was initially, I think, very strong. I, I don't, wouldn't actually remember exactly what happened with Ronan, but at the same time, you can see the use of that effect in comic books. Now I could show you. The She Hulk, but I don't want to do that as of right now. I want to go back to one other book to show you how recently. No, no, I was, I'm wrong. I'm, I'm not going to do that yet. I want to show you a, a cool effect of, um, since I pointed out the Fantastic Four, let's go to. Uh, this is from my collection of, um, was it um, Gitcore? They had scans of um, comic books. The other was scans of books I have in my, um, what is it, it has in my, um, in my collection. So this is um, the scans of the actual comic books. So if you can look at this, one of the things, you know, to know where with Kirby is uh, sort of the minimalist approach, that sort of thing. So I just want to hint of like not, you don't always, you now Kirby's known for going overboard as far as his designs, his, his, his architecture. And this is something very simple to draw for it to be there every week. And which is cool, it's still cool. This has a back and forth between fans, but the flying back death tub always comes back from time to time. So I wanted to go to something that's gonna lead to something bigger, which is the ultimate nullifier. And this was a, another like a cool little thing of something that tiny stopping Galactus for some reason, but we never got to see it in use. So this would be, I think, the second time Walter Simonson followed John Byrne, but if we look at, if we look at this right here, I wanna show you what's the issue, I, I went too far first. So if we look at, if we look at um, this issue at the Fantastic Four, which is um, three, this issue is 341. In this issue, they have to stop Galactus, who has been been turned into a um, not only matter devouring, 
creature, but he also is devouring time. So the only way to stop Galactus is obviously the ultimate nullifier. So they get the ultimate nullifier after a, obviously a more in-depth story. If we go to it, we actually get to see what happens when you use the ultimate nullifier. And Galactus has a moment of consciousness as he's turned into this machine, he sees it, he knows what the plan is, and then next thing you know, he takes the ultimate nullifier. And then he holds it in his hand, forget the ad, it's uh, not relevant. And we see the ultimate nullifier nullify everything. And then we see it nullify even more behind Fantastic Four in the Cosmic Sled. And we see another on white, and then we see them escape. So that's another cool effect of using white as a solid plane. And I want to use the lack, it'll be the, the reverse of it again, but you know, what can we do? This will be something show recently that it's been used. And, uh, here we go. We have Doomsday Clock. Now, I'm not sure how many fans of Doomsday Clock, but it was a very successful series. Um, utilizing the Watchmen characters and the DC characters, a crossover of some sorts. A uh, true sequel, as I say, just like Ghostbusters 2. So if you look at this book, this is supposed to be touted a big battle between Superman and Dr. Manhattan. So I'll give you a quick look at that. This is like a scans of the comic I had somewhere in the house. So this turned into, you know, instead of them fighting, Dr. Manhattan had this moment. He has his moment. He's like, wow, I don't know, we didn't have to fight. And then he's starting to think about it. He's like, hey, you know what? He decided to change reality. And then what happens? You see, uh, we get scared. The actual Superman, he's losing him. We're seeing him. He's totally gone. Black. And here we go again. Well, we're not seeing what happened, but it shows that there's nothing. He's recreating the universe. And then we getting we know the pacing is starting to build up. Something's gonna happen, and it leads to the Superman being born again, and all these alternate sort of storylines. So ultimately, if we go back to where we started from, which would be here's our Alpha Flight thing. There we go. Go back to Alpha Flight. This is an element that hasn't left comic books. So, and um, I think it was an interesting choice. It's now, obviously as a fan, you just want to fight, but ultimately it's a fun choice to do as a comic creator. And, um, you know, something different from just your regular fight that you get. Now, these days, all people really want is the fights and they look at anything we the you see two heroes together and they don't fight it's kind of like kind of got gypped but this is what you there for is supposed to be the story not just endless battles between the heroes and it gives you something different because you can get that somewhere else somewhere in this month you don't have to say well no i want john byrne to do it so fans are going to complain regardless so that's it on this approach to storytelling and um how it was used afterwards. It was definitely something used afterwards. It's kind of hinted that you could be be done in mad comic books, but then Byrne, for this wacky event, used it for a flight number six. Thank you, everybody. I'm out.